Hello, my name is Sean Easton. I teach in the Department of Greek, Latin, and Classical Studies at Gustavus Adolphus College in Minnesota, USA. Thank you for watching my paper. In his epic film, Sikander, the first full-length movie with Alexander the Great as a subject, director Saurabh Modi divides his scenes of battle into three sequences, all made from footage drawn overwhelmingly from Carmine Galone's 1937 Italian fascist film, Scipione l'Africano, about Rome's victory over Carthage at the end of the third century BCE. I argue, that Modi uses this plundered battle footage to create a film that is anti-fascist as well as anti-colonialist. It is in cinematic, it is a cinematic engagement with the problem that the state of the world at the time presented him with as a politically engaged Indian filmmaker. Great Britain, perhaps the paramount military adversary of the Axis powers during the production of the film, was also India's colonial oppressor. The parallels that Modi establishes between his Macedonian invaders of India, Angolones Romans, and his Indian defenders, Angolones Carthaginians, connect thematically the colonized regions of South Asia and Africa through their common experience of a European invader. Viewed in this way, the history of British colonial imperialism in India and the contemporary fascist wars of conquest are resolved into a single adversary. Sikandar and his Macedonian army. Yet the character of Sikandar is played to the hilt by Prithviraj Kapoor, pictured on the right, perhaps the most glamorous leading man of the day in Indian cinema. He appears in the film variously as a merry megalomaniac, a courageous adventurer, a nearly sociopathic risk taker, a sad lover, a happy lover, a noble soldier, a cold tyrant, and so on. At some points in the film, his manner could be seen to resemble in its sheer histrionic excess, the public speaking style of a Mussolini or a Hitler. But his character is too multifaceted and engaging to sustain on its own protracted alignment with the present day Axis dictators. Accordingly, Modi supplements the plot with recognizable fascist symbols and gestures, such as the raise arm salute. The centerpiece, however, of Modi's representation of fascism in his movie is his insertion of Galone's footage. This enables Modi to juxtapose current fascist military adventurism with British colonial imperialism, presenting the two as alternative manifestations of a primarily European threat to Africa and Asia. Alexander the Great reached the Indus River in spring of 326 BCE. This river was arguably the natural eastern frontier of the Persian Empire, which had fallen to him following his victory over Darius III at Gaugamela five years before. Alexander crossed the Indus, and from antiquity to today, there is debate about where he would have stopped. This is the region in which Sikandar is set, and which you see circled in the slide. When he reached the next river, the Hadaspes, now called the Jelum, the first of four tributaries to the east, the formidable army of Porus, the Indian king who ruled in that region, was massed on the further bank. The battle they fought, the mutiny of Alexander's troops soon after, despite the battle being another victory for them, are the climactic events which close Alexander's eastward journey of conquest. These events figure significantly in Sikandar. According to the ancient Greco-Roman sources, after a protracted series of staged maneuvers to deceive Porus into believing that no crossing was imminent, Alexander managed to land a substantial force at night on Porus's side of the river. There, he defeated in short order the king's son, commanding an advance force, and then Porus himself with the main army. In making a film about a European invader and a heroic Indian defense, Modi was tackling an obviously sensitive subject. British colonial authorities had been concerned with the potentially subversive nature of historical dramas when they were still confined to the 19th century stage. The Dramatic Performances Act of 1876 allowed the colonial government to ban dramas that promoted disaffection with their authority. 
Their capacity to arouse anti-colonial hostility inspired a new round of censorship laws in the 20th century with the Indian Cinematograph Act of 1918. Censorship laws in the 20th century, which established a board of censors to approve films for viewing. With the onset of World War II, the 1939 Defense of India Act increased the colonial authorities' powers of intervention. 1940, saw the introduction of an official British film propaganda policy, and in 1942, shortly after Sikander's release, movies were made subject to a set of rules called the Prevention of Prejudicial Acts and Control of Information, which allowed any film deemed helpful to the enemy to be banned. In this atmosphere, Sikander was initially approved for theatrical release, but its depiction of the mutiny of Sikander's army and the nationalistic resonance of Porus's nobility and defiance, Porus being played by Modi himself, proved too much. The approval was partially reversed and the film banned in areas where military personnel were concentrated. However sensitive the material, Modi personally underscores the significance of the movie's battle scenes with the following acknowledgement. I express my deepest gratitude to Her Highness Maharani Tarabai Saheba of Kolhapur and state officials for their valuable help in shooting the battle scenes in Sikandar. While it is evident in the film, as it is, that there was need for such resources, the statement could lead the viewer to assume incorrectly that the film's battle sequences are original to the movie. There is understandable confusion about Modi's use of Golone's footage. Publications as recent as 2017 have referred to the battle as Modi's own work, which I also thought until I was well along in my research. It is the encyclopedic 2017 dissertation on Scipione L'Africano and its legacy, along with the 1914 Italian silent epic Cabiria by Davila Vargas Machuca that demonstrates in an academic context, Modi's use of the plundered footage with a side-by-side -side comparison of images from the two movies. Yet there were levels of awareness before that. For Rose Vasunya in his 2010 chapter on Sikander, cites the French language website Peplum, which is devoted to films and cartoons about the ancient Greco-Roman world, noting that it suggests, quote, some of the battle scenes are based on Carmine Galone's Scipio L'Africano. This restatement actually softens the Peplum site's claim, which is correctly that Modi's battle scenes are almost entirely from footage inserted from Galone's film. Yet Peplum also calls this stock footage, indicating that the reasons for using it, additionally, are basically logistical and nothing more. Golone's film is certainly well stocked with resources useful for a film like Sikander. At Italy's recently opened Cine Città Studios, Golone had the support of Mussolini's government with the dictator's then 21-year-old son Vittorio serving as his producer. The regime furnished the production with 2,000 cavalry, 10,000 battlefield extras, and 30 elephants in order to recreate the Battle of Zama, fought between Roman general Scipio Africanus and Carthaginian Hannibal in 202 BCE. Historian Robin Lane Fox, who served as consultant for and background actor in Oliver Stone's 2004 Alexander, asserts, based on this firsthand experience, that no amount of training and controlled proximity between horses and elephants would have accustomed horses either to fight against or anywhere near elephants. The website Peplum cites the difficulties of managing elephants in Stone's production as evidence for why Modi would have simply used Galone's pre-existing footage. All this makes it important to note that the Indian film industry of the time was fairly informal about splicing footage from other films and indeed remained so until its corporatization in the 1990s. Golone's movie was well known and had been screened internationally. 
which would have accounted for the availability of its film reels when Modi was making Sikandar several years later. Pre-independence India's film uh, community was both sophisticated in its own right and attentive to cinematographic technique internationally, which included interwar collaboration and exchange of various sorts with Germany and pre-World War II Italy. Modi's production team on Sikandar was directly connected to this cosmopolitan history through its cinematographer Y.D. Sarpatar, who had traveled with a delegation of India camera persons to Germany, France, and Italy in 1934 to study film technique. I say this by way of stressing that I am discussing the splicing in of Galone's footage as a central ingredient in an artistic achievement. It is therefore important to understand the editing in of battle footage from Galone's film as an artistic challenge as much, and I believe more, than simple opportunism. I focus therefore on how Modi creates meaning in Sikandar through this editing process and establishes continuity with that footage through original scenes, despite the considerable differences in tone and ideology between the two films. Scholarship on Sikandar has primarily explored its anti-colonialist dimension, largely omitting consideration of any anti-fascist aspects. As Feroz Vasunia observes, contemporary Indian newspaper reports uh, mention the film's implications for its World War II moment, not its anti-colonialist character. That is not surprising insofar as established news sources within British India might not wish to broach the sensitive topic of anti-colonialist content, especially during wartime. But their expectation that Sikandar would apply, would apply to the environment of world war suggests that we too should explore this dimension of the film. Let us look then at the anti-fascist cues in Sikandar. Galone has his Romans use the fascist raised arm salute to symbolize a transcendent connection between Republican Rome and Mussolini's regime. Modi transfers this gesture to his Macedonians. Martin Winkler, in his study of the raised arm salute, notes that both Galone's Romans and Carthaginians deliver it, but the Romans do so with erect bearing and the Carthaginians with head and overall posture bent forward, suggesting their culturally subservient disposition. Modi has his Macedonians deliver the salute in Galone's Carthaginian fashion. Except for the highest ranking characters, Aristotle and Sikander himself, who salute with back and head held straight. By having his Macedonians use the Carthaginian rather than the Roman version of the salute, Modi seems to suggest that they are dominated rather than led by Sikander, a condition which changes at the end of the film when his armies mutiny against his leadership. All this begs the question of how far the film actually goes in terms of an anti-fascist narrative. The question can be most fully answered when the use to which Modi put Galone's film is considered in the context of contemporary events and Italy's role as an embodiment of Axis aggression is factored into consideration. Italy's fascist regime, propagandizing for its 1935 to 36 invasion of Ethiopia, was drawn to the idea of presenting Galone's title hero as an ancient counterpart to contemporary Italy's fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. Modi reproduces this linkage in his battle scenes through the insertion of Galone's battle footage, but substitutes Sikander for Scipio. To illustrate this point, I will briefly discuss Modi's version of the battle of, of the Hadas space between Sikander and Porus, where most of the spliced in footage is located. <clears throat> Modi prepares for the spliced footage in which Galone's Carthaginians appear as the Indian defenders by showing Porus mounted on an elephant which is outfitted with exactly the same armor, equipment, and insignia as Galone's Carthaginian elephants. 
Modi shows the helmeted Sikander on his horse, delivering his pre-battle speech to his troops. Then comes a cut, and we suddenly see Fasques filling the screen. Fasques are the ceremonial rods and axes that the special attendants, called lictors, of a Roman consul carry. In a moment of apparent discontinuity, the camera rises above them just to barely disclose from behind and at a distance a now helmetless leader, circled in the slide, exhorting his army to victory. Modi cuts again to the helmeted Kapoor as Sikander from in front, completing the speech. There is no historical reason to account for the presence of Fasques around ancient Macedonian or Greek leaders, but they would be recognizable as the symbol of Mussolini's fascist government. When I first saw the film and wasn't aware of the splicing, I assumed that this was simply a casual bit of ancient stuff which remained in the modern European and European-derived iconography of power thrown into the scene, as happens everywhere in historical film up to the present day, as a sort of garnish for effect rather than for historical accuracy. As we can see on the right of the slide, however, the Fasque scene is exactly the same uh, footage as in Galone's movie. Awareness that this shot is spliced into Sikander from Scipio L'Africano radically deepens the significance of the analogy between the Macedonian invader and Mussolini's fascists, especially as the audio of Sikander's exhortation to invade India plays over Galone's visual of Scipio delivering his pre-battle speech at Zama. After Porus delivers his pre-battle speech, he orders the advance of his elephants and Galone's footage resumes. The formerly Carthaginian, now Indian elephants accelerate their pace, now hurtling toward the Macedonian lines, which begin to stagger backward. Modi then stops the spliced footage and instead recreates the next part of the scene from Galone's movie so that Kapoor as Sikander can be seen performing the act himself. In Galone's film, Scipio rushes to respond to his front line's wavering resolve against the charging elephants. He gallops up on his white horse, dismounts, and strides to the front line. He seizes a spear from a soldier and hurls it at the enemy. Galone's camera Next shows the spear lodging in the eye of an oncoming elephant, bringing it down. Modi has, his, has Sikander gallop off on his black horse. He runs out in front of his ranks, seizes the spear, and throws it. The spliced footage then resumes with the spear lodging in the elephant's eye. The splicing strongly underscores the thematic anti-colonialist connection between India and Africa by aligning Porus with Hannibal and Sikander with Scipio. At this moment in Galone's film, Hannibal is defending Carthage on African soil against invaders from Italy. The war for which Galone's film was to serve as propaganda the invasion of Ethiopia in 1935 and 36 was in fact Italy's second Ethiopian war. Its first ended with a lasting wound to the newly united Italy's military pride when the Ethiopian army defeated Italian forces at the Battle of Adwa in 1896, stopping Italy's colonial ambitions there for nearly four decades. Mussolini was resolved to be the conqueror of Ethiopia. Galone accordingly suggests that as Scipio was the avenger of Cannae, Mussolini will be the aven avenger of Adwa. He does so by beginning the film with a shot of the aftermath of Rome's greatest defeat among the several that Hannibal dealt them, the battle, at, uh, the battle of Cannae, 15 years before Zama. As the camera pans over a vista strewn with slaughtered Romans, a voice invokes Canai's Roman dead.
The character of Kapoor's Sikander is certainly compatible with an anti-colonialist narrative attentive to cynical foreign manipulation of Indian conflicts and displays of moral hypocrisy, the narrative on which scholarship has tended to focus. But he doesn't quite feel like a fascist dictator. Modi's use of Galone's battle footage allows him to frame battle itself, the most inhumane moments in the film, as a manifestation of the present day Axis threat. Modi's plundering of Galone's footage is therefore a fundamentally artistically successful and important act, rather than a merely logistical workaround or much less a failure of artistry. Thank you. Thank you.